Over nine years, from 1964 to 1973, the United States dropped more than two million tons of bombs here in Laos. More than we dropped on Germany and Japan combined during all of World War II. It made Laos per person the most heavily bombed country in history. As one Laotian said, the bombs fell like rain. Senator, do you believe that the United States should be in the business of protecting Laotian independence? I do not. I don't see why 10,000 miles away we have to babysit the world and gendarme the world at the cost of many billions of dollars a month in these countries, when at the same time we know how desperately we need this money for the growing domestic problems at home. Villages and entire valleys were obliterated. The ancient plain of jars was devastated. Countless civilians were killed. And that conflict was another reminder that whatever the cause, whatever our intentions, war inflicts a terrible toll. I don't know why uh, we've fallen into an attitude uh, in some parts of this country where we think it's all right to use 500 bombers a day against a country and then say it's a very limited operation, that we're going to be careful not to put in ground forces. I might say that that's how we got started in uh, Vietnam. We had helicopters over there and reconnaissance flights and advisors, and we were given assurances that we weren't going into a land war in Asia, but we've got 500,000 men in on the ground now. Six decades ago, this country fell into civil war. And as the fighting raged next door in Vietnam, your neighbors and foreign powers, including the United States, intervened here. As a result of that conflict and its aftermath, many people fled or were driven from their homes. What I and I think most of my colleagues wish is a disengagement of both in both Vietnam and Laos. These recent activities in Laos make us apprehensive that, that we, we're getting deeper involved there, a deeper involvement. Really, I'm a Vietnam veteran, but I, I only spent a few minutes in Vietnam because unlike Utapau, Udorn, Karat, all the other Thai bases, we supported the CIA in what was called a secret war. And that was in Laos and Cambodia. The, the Ho Chi Minh Trail came down around there and we tried to interdict as much as we could from our base because we were right on the Mekong River, right across from Laos. Along the flank of Southern Asia, the coastline of North and South Vietnam takes the form of an elongated S, a demilitarized zone between the two countries along the 17th parallel at the sea was established by solemn treaty. To the north is China. To the west are Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma. This is the battlefield in Laos. These are government troops supported and financed by the United States, fighting and losing ground to communist troops, many of them from North Vietnam. It was the same thing as the Vietnam War, but it was, it was called the secret war because we weren't allowed to say anything about anything and we really, everybody knew we were there, but we couldn't say anything. So when I got sent to Vietnam, I actually got sent to NKP Thailand, which is knock on Phnom, and uh, that was in September 69. I was born in Beloit. Well, we lived on a farm, and the hospital was in Beloit, but we lived on a farm. Then we moved to Beloit 
till I was nine, and then we moved uh, essentially to Waukegan. And I grew up there until I joined the service, went to college, and then joined the service. During junior high and high school, Art was in ROTC and the Civil Air Patrol. ROTC stands for the Reserve Officer Training Corps. When you are part of ROTC, you take part in military courses teaching you the basics of the branch of military that you wish to partake in. Art chose the Air Force. Back then, I was just a cadet, and just what, it, what they do now is uh, you learn to drill and you learn about aircraft. And I was a cadet before John Glenn made his first flight. So back then, it was all rockets more than anything else. In January of 1968, Korea captured one of our ships. And Lyndon Johnson, who was president at the time, said, it doesn't, I don't care about Vietnam, we're going to go get our ship. And I figured, okay, fine, we're going to war with North Korea, we're already going to war with, in Vietnam, they're going to get me no matter what, so I went down and enlisted. And then in May of 68, I, joined, I went in. Soon after enlisting, Art was sent to boot camp. Boot camp in the Air Force is real simple. I mean, the, the obstacle course was a joke. Uh, the only hard part about boot camp was getting up at 4 o'clock every morning, going to bed at 7 o'clock every night or whatever it was. In tech school, it was technical. I mean, I was a radar nav aide. So first you had to learn all the basic electronics, then you had to learn all the, the systems. And uh, that was hard. But that was more cerebral than it was physical, where boot camp was more physical than it was cerebral. Normally when you get off a bus and you, somebody says line up, they say please line up over here. Well in boot camp they don't say please line up over here, they say line up here. And if you don't, they come get in your face and get all over you and uh, uh, they don't get too physical with you but they make you feel like you're this big and uh, uh, they do what they can to make sure that you understand that they're in charge. And it's nothing like civilian life. After boot camp, they treat you like a human being, but before then, or during boot camp, you're just another dog to kick. Communism notwithstanding, they had the domino theory, and they had this theory and that theory. The problem was they were all theories. Communism, according to all its own leaders, must be a system of international control and conformity. Thus, at its very heart, it is the complete opposite and enemy of any kind of nationalism. Its avowed program is to destroy totally the religions, governments, institutions, and traditions of the Christian world, the Buddhist world, the Islamic world, the Judaic world, and the world of every religion and culture. The, the French had been vanquished, but now the North Vietnamese were pushing the South Vietnamese. It was a very, very corrupt government. And really, I don't think we had, looking back now, hindsight being better than foresight, um, we should never have been in there because it was such a corrupt government. The communist rulers then proposed to substitute a whole new system of thought and control dictated from Communist Party headquarters. They think that a few theorists and rulers know what is best for everyone, and they are determined to drive everyone toward that kind of world. When we landed, uh, uh, we got into Dong Mong in Bangkok. That was the, the main airport there, still is. And we, they herded us all into a C-130, and we made a, 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 a circuit, because the only way in or out of NKP was by boat or aircraft. We were about nine miles off the Mekong River, so the first thing I saw at NKP that I didn't see at the other bases was machine gun nests all the way around the perimeter. And the reason was Ho Chi Minh was born there, so we had special activities every once in a while. The advantage I had over a lot of other guys was I had three years of Civil Air Patrol and I had three years of ROTC. So when I went in the Air Force, I already knew the basic, what chain of command was. I knew uh, drill and ceremonies. Um, uh, I pretty much knew what was going on. What I didn't know was simply the uh, Air Force customs and courtesies and 
uh, the way they wear their uniform and all that other stuff. That was all the new stuff. But that was pretty simple. One thing that really made me mad was uh, it was raining like heck one day and I was taking an electronics course and I had a slide rule. And because back then they didn't have calculators. And I'm, I, I got everything under my poncho like this and I'm running along and all of a sudden I hear my slide rule fall. And I turned around to pick it up and um, an APC, Armored Personnel Carrier, came r rumbling down the road and ran right over it. And it ended up like this, so that sort of irritated me, but that kind of, that was a different where I wanted to shoot the driver. Blue Beret would jump down and get the pilot and grab him and bring him back. Um, that happened every, every, just about every week, two or three times, um, sometimes for a day or two. But I was never involved in those other than fixing the aircraft. So, well, the nav aids, yeah, navigational aids, uh, instrument landing system, tack in, VOR, altimeters, uh, instrumentation, that sort of stuff. Everybody, everybody made fun of us all the time. Actually, they were jealous because we got to work in air conditioning because of electronics. Inside the building, it was beautiful. In, outside, it was always miserable. In the wintertime, it was cold and rainy. Uh, it never stopped and there was nothing but red mud all over everything. In the summertime, there was no rain, and uh, it was hotter than Hades. And uh, when it did rain, it rained like bath water. F-105s returned from strikes against military targets in North Vietnam during the height of one of the heaviest monsoons in Southeast Asia. This monsoon, while it is a factor in our military operations, the problems it presents are not insurmountable. The sheet metal guys had to work in an open building uh, with no air conditioning, no nothing, you know, so we were called the black boxers. We had a search and rescue going, and you could see out across, across the treetops uh, from where our, our runway was, you could see Laos on the other side of the river, you could see mountains. And we had to go across there to get to this pilot. And for three days, they tried to get across there. And they couldn't. And we were creating more casualties. So one night, we were just kind of out there watching. And we were in charge of uh, what's called a starlight scope. You, you know the, the night vision goggles? Well, in 1970, that was just a scope. And it was brand new technology. And we, were, we did the fixing of them. There wasn't a lot to do, but we did the fixing. Um, and we were watching and we just saw a bunch of flashes going like this. And we thought, well, it's still going on. The next morning, the mountain wasn't there. And they got the pilot and came back. And the reason was some B-52s came in and just blew it away. Did you have a favorite out of all those planes that you worked on? The A-1. What made it your favorite? It's a cool airplane. <laughs> <laughs> what makes it cooler than? Well, it's, 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 it's a vintage aircraft. It's, uh, it's, uh, it didn't see a lot of service in World War II because it didn't come out until the end, but it did see a lot of service in, uh, um, in Korea. Engine, 18 cylinder, reciprocating. Cruising speed, 190 miles per hour. Range, 2,700 miles. Ordnance load, 8,000 pounds. Manufactured 1945. Today, 28 versions later, the A1 Sky Raider is the Sandy in Southeast Asia. And like I said, it's almost impossible to shoot them down. Uh, they have the folding wings and stuff so you, they can fly off aircraft carriers. In fact, they were Navy planes for a long time. Um, uh, the instrumentation and stuff is pretty simple. Uh, it's complicated but simple, if you know what I mean. Um, they had a Yankee ejection system in them, which is uh, when you pull a thing like this, a rocket uh, goes, a spindle goes up like this and knocks the canopy away, then a rocket ejects, erects this way, and it shoots you out 300 feet above the aircraft. And we had one come in with a hung ordnance and it blew up on a runway and a pilot ejected right on the right, just as he touched, and uh, 
because uh, he tried to guide it in and he broke an ankle, but it got him clear of the aircraft. So, you know, there's just a lot of things. Uh, the air brakes uh, on it are, were just, they're huge. Uh, you know, they hit the air brakes, these flaps come out this way to slow the aircraft down. That was pretty fun. You see them on the back of jets now. When you when a when jet comes in, the back of the engine flares this way. That's a brake. Um, did you have any feelings about Jane Fonda? Yeah. <laughs> Should have been shot in North Vietnam. Other than that, no problem. That happened while I was there, I think, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure. I was in the service anyway. And I remember being totally, absolutely disgusted. Any serviceman will tell you that mail from home is number one on his personal list and the men in the Air Force Postal Service are keenly aware of this importance. I wrote my wife every day, my family usually once a week, you know, parents. Brothers and sisters, I wrote them occasionally, the, uh, the bars, telephone. Uh, called my parents two or three times that year and my wife five or six times. Sent everybody gifts every couple months. To be honest, I never read the letters I sent home. And I don't know if there was any Censors, censorship there. I don't even know if they censored them from Vietnam. I would have been pretty irritated if they did. And have it delivered to every air base, Coast Guard installation, Naval Land Station, Navy ship at sea, and civilian agency in the area. Art often had bad memories while at NKP, some he will never forget. A helicopter, Jolly Green helicopter, had come back, and I just happened to be standing there uh, in the area, and it had taken a, a, a 35 millimeter cannon shell right in the gunner's position. It blew out the whole inside. Well, it also blew the gunner and two guys all over the inside, and I happened to be there to see that, and that, I still occasionally hear nightmares about that. Although Art had some bad memories, he remembers the good times also. The high point of my whole time at NKP was December 28th of 1969. That's when Bob Hope came. An exotic, enchanting Thailand, sometimes known as Birdland East. <laughs> Thailand means home of the free, which is based on an old American phrase, foreign aid. <laughs> Five thousand guys, no women, all restricted to the base, watching this show. Probably the emotional high point of my life, or low point, was that day because they had uh, Bob Hope and Neil Armstrong was there and uh, the Rockets, but at the end, the whole troop sang Silent Night. Then the entire bass sang Silent Night. <laughs> and I still can't listen to that song without a tear to my eye. And I'm getting all chills right now. because that was the ultimate emotional moment in my whole life. And I still, I'm, I'm tingling right now just thinking about it. And I, listen, I hear that song on the radio and I have to turn it off. I start crying. I still do.
we were supposed to have three days in Bangkok free, you know, just to run, run around and do, you know, visit the city and see all that. Well, we were all in the, in the terminal there at NKP, a C-130 had come in, and we ended up spending two days sitting in the terminal waiting to get out because they had insurgents in our bomb dump trying to blow up our bombs. So they wouldn't let anybody in or out. So my three-day leave in Bangkok was just not working. Basically, I got to Bangkok, spent the night the next morning, got on an air, got a Freedom Bird, and came home. Before the parade, mass draft card burning was urged. Demonstrators claimed 200 cards were burned, but no accurate count could be determined. Reporters and onlookers were jostled away on purpose. Although mostly peaceful, shouted confrontations were frequent and fiery during the course of the march. San Francisco Airport, which is where it landed, was, uh, we had uh, hippies and everybody there this was 1970, and it was right in the, at the height of the uh, protests and everything, and they used to, they spit at us, they threw things at us, stuff like that. Pacifists and hippies together. Gigantic Kizar Stadium holds the mass rally, where anti-war songs and speeches figure a short scuffle between pro and con factions. No one was injured. I knew that there were protests and stuff, and I disagreed with the protests, um, but I never thought I would be a part of it uh, on the receiving end of it. And uh, I'd heard about it, but I, it just never, maybe I was just naive. It was uh, quite disheartening to have uh, long-haired hippie freaks uh, yelling at you, spitting at you, throwing tomatoes and stuff. They cleared the base when they built it with Agent Orange, is what I understand. Um, I've been told to uh, apply to the VA and get a compensation for it. Um, I believe that it has something to do with all the, I have a list of things this long that's wrong with me and some of them probably are, have something to do with Agent Orange. Pretty much if you were in country, they'll, they'll give you whatever you want. When was the first time you were thanked for your service? I would say when the wall went up, because uh, people were made aware of it. Before that, they knew that it was a war, but they didn't really pay any attention. And they really didn't give a crap about us. But when that wall went up and people started seeing all those names, and that there were real human beings that gave their lives for an ideal, um, then I think people started thinking about it. Today I stand with you in acknowledging the suffering and sacrifices on all sides of that conflict. And from the anguish of war, there came an unlikely bond between our two peoples. Today, the United States is home to many proud Laotian Americans. Many have made a hard journey through refugee camps and relocation, building new lives in a new country. And even as they've become Americans, they've held on to their Lao heritage, worshiping in their temples, honoring their elders, dancing the Lam Yong. Even now, they remember a beloved song that if we depart from our homeland and flee far away from her, we will always have you as our true friend as long as we live. We've got some guests in the studio. Would you uh, gentlemen care to introduce yourselves? We'll start with you, sir. You seem to be the authority figure here. Well, I don't know about that, but um, <laughs> I'm Nick Stange, and I am the teacher, one of the teachers of the Harlem Veteran Project. Over Nick, at Harlem good to high see school. you this morning. Thanks for coming in. Oh, no problem. A I'm, young man? I'm Carson Menke. I'm a senior at Harlem High School. Nice. Yeah, basically what we do is we have veterans come in. It originally started with World War II veterans about six years ago, and we have them come in, and we actually record their interview with the audio and video. And the students um, do everything, pretty much. 
I just turn on the lights and make sure the camera's plugged in and let the students go. So they ask the veterans questions, and we've now branched out to Korean War, Vietnam, and we've even done some Afghan and Persian Gulf War vets. And the students interview them, and then the following school year, what happens is every student in the class gets an individual, and their task is to take that typically about a 90-minute raw interview and make it into a 30 to 45-minute documentary. Vet Doc is a special program I'm proud to be a part of. Are you taught me about the secret war and the civil war in Laos, something I never knew about, but something that I will never forget. All the countless corrections and all the time and effort that I put into this documentary has made me a better person. And I think about you when I go to work and I think about other veterans that come into my work and I think about how they sacrifice their time to protect our rights and freedoms. Art's been a big part of my day-to-day -day life. I think about making corrections to his documentary every day, and I think about what I can do to make it better for him and his family. I think about all the corrections I've made, all the time I've put into this, and all the time he put in. Thank you. you first uh, saw your wife being back in the States after being gone for about a year, what was that day like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was exciting. It was uh, nice to be home. We didn't go to dinner first. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> a, a, a rocket hit across the runway from me one time and a piece of shrapnel hit me in the head but I had my pith helmet on. I think I showed you my pith helmet. Yeah, I think you did. Um, didn't hurt me but it sure did a job on the helmet. So that's about it. That's all, that's all my war stories now. You can have it. You can, if, if you want souvenirs, you can have it. Because I don't, uh, it's sitting in a closet right now and has been ever since I moved here. I'll never put it out again. If you want to if you want it, you can have it. The only thing that's missing is the leather strap that goes inside to, to fit your head.